live from CUBE headquarters in Palo Alto, California. It's the Silicon Valley Friday Show with John Furrier. Hey, hello everyone, you listen to the Silicon Valley Friday Show. I'm John Furrier. This week, my guest again is Jeff Frick, and we have uh, no guests in the studio. It's a busy week, people are working, kind of scratching their heads, Jeff, uh, uh, for the, the Trump election. Still kind of reeling, but substantive conversations, but also people are busy getting ready for Thanksgiving. It's our last show before Thanksgiving and Turkey Day. A lot to be thankful for, a lot to be concerned about. You know, it's, 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 <laughs> it's the 18th of November. Calendar keeps moving. It's just really busy. This week, super busy. You know, I think the top stories are really clear. Obviously, the Trump depression continues for the Democrats. Uh, and the world revolts, people walking out of school. They don't even know what they're protesting. So that kind of falls on the uh, what the F department, WTF. Um, because I just don't understand. You just got to move on. And I think people are moved on. And it's interesting. There's some people in Silicon Valley that have been uh, really kind of vocal about it and, and vocal in a trolling way. But others have been... Uh, being substantive, for instance, uh, Jeff Hammerbacher, founder of Cloudera, had a great thread within his friend group. Really awesome conversation. People like Jeff, um, Joe Hurd, he's now at Facebook, another entrepreneur, uh, Mary Hodder, Dave Hodson, Shervin Pejavar, Julie, Juliana. These guys are having conversations. They're, they're thought leaders, but they don't claim themselves as thought leaders. But when, when things matter, they're actually organizing substantive conversations. Others aren't. Others just, you know, barking at the moon saying the left sucks, the right sucks. And so that's an interesting week for me. Well, hopefully we can get back to a point where we can have constructive conversations and constructive dialogues with different points of view and not just go straight to the whatever card you want to try to pull out so that's it's actually a good thing yeah I'll, I'll never unfriend someone for having a different opinion if they're a jerk you know I'll block them and unfriend them but you know I welcome I respect people's opinions and I love the, the discourse if there's conversations I mean come on put it out there lead by the engagement I think that's what I'm looking at and I could see people and, and, it's, and it shows the personality too I, I saw John Lilly from Greylock uh, one of my Facebook friends a great guy he had a different kind of reflection he was just kind of like checking in with people he's an amiable type of personality and his his, his role was to check in. Dave Hornick at August Capital had some interesting reflections. He was much more kind of like hurt, but then he kind of reflected back. And, and again, that's a positive, and I think more of that would be better. And again, this is where you know I see I see this outcome of Trump being you know uh, obviously important for Silicon Valley and others, where the leaders actually step up and reflect and actually have a conversation. Yeah, and, and, and it's good. A lot of them too are now ending in the final paragraph. And even Dave Chappelle on Saturday Night Live, you know, and he scheduled yeah, yeah. that. He certainly wasn't expecting <laughs> Trump to win. But even after his monologue, it, and it's a terrific monologue. You see, there's a lot of things going on besides the election that are that are problematic. But at the very end of his, I think his 11 minute monologue, pretty long. He even said, you know, in the spirit of moving forward, I'm going to give the guy a chance i'm going to actually uh, hope that he's successful yeah. um and and we're and we'll go from there and then we'll see you know we'll see what happens it, it, i think the the discourse that it in, in inspired is great the conversation is great uh, what the execution is is now on Trump and his team, and we'll see what happens. Hey, you listen to this Silicon Valley Friday show. I'm John Furrier, Jeff Frick, and we're going to have some guests dial in. We're going to try to dial up a couple of VCs. And and for the folks watching, we we kind of call it a crank call, but it's really not. I do ping them over the week and say, hey, I might call you. It's not kind of set up in any way. All we do is say we might call you. There's a handful of people we're going to call. We'll see if they pick up. There's a few on the list here. We'll go down that later. But we'll go and cover their firm. If they don't pick up, we'll talk behind their back, and <laughs> and they'll regret not picking up. But that's a different story. Uh, all good guys. Guys, and um, there's no, no no bad there, Jeff. The big thing that that we talked about a couple weeks ago, we and and we highlighted it again last week was this whole fake news thing. That now has gone completely mainstream, and this is a great example of our point about having a conversation and then leveling it up. And there's one thing I learned from Charlie Senate over at the Ground Truth is a conversation and surfacing up to a national and then international narrative is really the way it works organically. And so you're seeing the fake news thing come out of the woodwork to be. A, a geeky conversation in Silicon Valley. Now it's on NPR, it's on everyone's thing. President of the United States, Barack Obama even weighed in. And this is a real deal. Facebook's taking a lot of heat, as is Google for the search results. And Google's actually coming out and will ban sites for fake news. So fake news, some are saying, swung the election. Uh, BuzzFeed had an article that said 20 fake election stories generated more engagement on Facebook than 20 election stories from the top 19 outlets. Think about that. Fake news beat out 
real news. <laughs> but, but, is it, but are you really surprised? Is anyone really surprised? It's caveat emptor. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. I mean, people, you have a basic responsibility to put a filter on that which you consume and that which you think is truth. And and you can't believe anyone. And, and I, I think the other powerful thing this points out, even real news is still written from a point of view and a bias. So you need to always have your filter on when you read, unless it's just the facts. Yeah. At the end of the game, the score was five to four. The choice of verbs, the choice of sentence structure. Read four different stories on the same event that you actually witnessed, and you'll yeah. see completely different points of view. So it's important. You need to be educated and use a little logic yeah. when you read. And just because it's written doesn't mean it's true. Yeah, and I put on my Facebook page last week right after the election. I said, listen, freedom of the press is paramount. And still, the New York Times is digging in, although they have another 40,000 increase in subscribers. Their ratings are going up, so so much for the New York Times failing. Is that the freedom of the press is super powerful because you have to have this this new outlet and what the election shows me and I commented on a TechCrunch post this morning about Apple hired this media guru is that the big corporate companies the tech companies hire these quote media experts and here's the deal the, the tech companies put these media guys in their back pocket and control them and what we learned in the election is that doesn't work and a new someone's going to fill it's like it's the plants grow weeds get pulled and another one grows in its place that is the role of the media and I think you're seeing what we talked about last week is this this is the dynamic that people are now coming to grips with. You can't control the media. You can't control the message. And the ones who can crowdsource it and get more data will win over the big big brands. Look at fake news <laughs> beat real news. Can you imagine if real news actually did work? Right, but let's talk about the real world, right? The winners write the history books, and that's just the way it is. So depending on what point of view you are, it's good or bad. The Arab Spring was good when social media helped. Uh, bring about great change because we were rooting for that that side uh, now suddenly the u.s yeah. fall is is not good i mean at the end of the day you need to be a responsible person and put a filter on it and and read it and make an opinion and know yeah. that it's not necessarily there's a great uh, there's a great article in new york times that was just came out and um it was called social media's globe shaking power and what it points to is your point about the Arab Spring. And I've said it Twitter about Twitter being valuable is Twitter is will always be valuable because it overthrew governments. We saw it in Egypt. You mentioned the Arab Spring. All this stuff is happening. It creates a freedom opportunity. And here, the United States got bit by the tool that they created. Absolutely. And everyone doesn't like the outcome. So, again, the power of social media is disrupting right. the U.S. now. Right. So, but again, this is not new. I mean, Howard Hughes, if when you owned the top half above the fold of the newspapers and there was only two, you owned the narrative. What got put there? What picture got put there? What was the headline? What verbs were you? Was 9 11 an attack or an incident? Right? Those are two different words that describe a very different kind of emotion. So, there is bias in everything we read. You need to read everything with a critical eye, and you need to get as many sources of data from different points yeah. of view so you can come to a conclusion. I do think what's really in interesting from the technology point of view is the self-selection because of, of, of uh, basically recommendation engine algorithms that unfortunately are going to feed you more of the same than what you consume unless you actively go off the reservation and read other publications yeah. that have a different point of view. It's interesting, Obama won the election at the beginning, his first term and second term, because he had um, superior social media uh, power. They pl Hillary tried to do the same playbook, and what we've been reporting and what's been reported out in the press is, turns out Trump had a lot of bots out there. Bots are a new phenomenon. So he had an army of bots, a new phenomenon. They were going with the old tried and true social media. So the impact of this is, as the technology moves, it's a responsibility of the folks to be aware of it yeah. and leverage it. And I think that is one of the impacts that people got to walk away is that, Every single day, there's a new opportunity to get the message out. Well, and the other thing, I just interviewed a guy from, from Mashable yesterday, and you know they do a lot of big data analysis on all the articles that go out, and they know what things trigger more consumption and less consumption and what factors feed in. Now, does that a menu that you give to your editorial staff to write to this menu? No. But it does influence how potentially you put the picture in, how you structure your sentences, how long is the duration of the thing. These are very real um, uh, items that are calculated in to drive consumption of these things. So the, the fake news, I mean, go to any news site and look down the bar. Those are all fake news stories. I mean, <laughs> what do we see at the grocery store and have seen at the grocery store line? I mean, the aliens, John, are in your house and having babies. I mean, this is not new news. <laughs> 
Well, Trump was dead and Mark Zuckerberg ate a dolphin last week. So, <laughs> so this you is know. not new, right? So <laughs> yeah. National Enquirer is true, not true? I mean, is this new that we've had these things? Look, it comes back down to the IQ of the audience. At the end of the day, you got we got to get smarter. I mean, basically, the, this election was the Jerry Springer show versus the real <laughs> the real meat, meat, meat and potatoes issues that people are cared about. You know, getting jobs, you know, getting internet. I mean, I was talking to Rob Hope, our editor-in-chief, and, you know, I think the big thing that no one's talking about is, you know, everyone thinks the job's going to come back. Hey, first thing the United States got to do is get internet access to all the places in the United States. Right. Let's right. wire the country up with high speed internet. Then people can get those new jobs. Yeah. Who knows? The next machine learning programmer could be out in Iowa or out in uh, the rural America. Once they get internet access, it's like access to knowledge, access to market and ideas. So to me, it's pretty no brainer. Screw the wall, bring internet access to everybody. <laughs> And then use drones instead of the wall. So much more efficient. They deliver pizza. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine drones? That would be total Skynet. Drones are that coming. Would be, They're coming. You know, the Terminator is here, you know, on, on the thing. Uh, go to crowdchat.net slash Silicon Valley. If you're watching right now, also it goes to a podcast on soundcloud.com slash John Furrier. This is the Silicon Valley Friday show with John Furrier. That's me and Jeff Frick. Normally we have a guest in, but we're going to dial up some people and see if we can get some conversation going with some VCs. And we'll be right back with more after this short break. Since the dawn of big data, the Cube has been there, connecting with executives, practitioners, entrepreneurs, thought leaders. But you're not a thought leader anymore. You're a futurist. That's the new trend. Futurist is the buzzword. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm very much living in the past. <laughs> I don't like the future. And I don't think much of the present. <laughs> and John Cleese. There's a lot of people out there who have no idea what they're doing, but they have absolutely no idea that they have no idea what they're doing. And those are the ones with the confidence of stupidity who finish up in power. That's why the planet doesn't work. Knowledgeable, insightful, and a true gentleman. And the guy at the counter recognized me and said, are you listening? Yes, I'm tweeting you away. Tweeting. Not, I tweet, I'm <laughs> tweeting away. He just got rude that way. But. <laughs> John Cleese joins the Cube alumni. Welcome, John. You got any phone calls you need to answer? Hold on, let me check. The Cube is a comfortable place. You come inside the Cube and we have a conversation, uh, almost as if it were a, a, a chance meeting. And we have a, a discussion about a particular topic. Our philosophy is everybody's expert at something. Everybody's passionate about something and has real deep knowledge about that something. Well, we want to focus in on that area and extract that knowledge and share it with our communities. So folks who have never heard of it before come in the Cube and say, wow, this is really cool what you guys are doing. It's unique. It adds value to the community. and It adds value by really sharing information. I can't tell you how many people stop me at conferences or on the streets, on our airport, say, hey, I love your show. People that I've never met before, they say to me, I know you, you don't know me. I watch the Cube, I queue up your videos, I listen to them while I'm on the, the treadmill. You know, it helps me, you know, learn, expands my knowledge, you know, thank you. So, you know, it's really an honor to be part of that community. This is Dave Vellante, thanks for watching the Cube. You're listening to the Silicon Valley Friday Show with John Furrier. Okay, we're back. You're listening to the Silicon Valley Friday Show. I'm John Furrier here with Jeff Frick. And then go to crowdchat.net slash Silicon Valley. If you have a question, we're going to post it right there. We'll get to it. Uh, but right now, this is our, our weekly show every Friday, 8 a.m. We'll broadcast it live, but it also goes out on demand on soundcloud.com slash John Furrier. Check it out. We're kind of on our seventh episode, trying new things. Uh, the new thing that I love is uh, dialing a VC up every week, which we'll do again. I was thinking, Jeff, we should dial up lawyers too when we need legal advice. We might as well just dial up whoever we want. <laughs> you know, so you know, it's fun to get people in into the conversation here in the studio, but uh, there's more news and more impact and kind of doing a deep dive on the technology area in Silicon Valley, you got to look at the, the bellwethers, look at the, some of the earnings. I don't want to go into deep dive on the earnings, but there are some notable earnings to look at this week that I think tell a tale and the story of where tech's going. One is Cisco earnings were down, they announced, as well as Salesforce. So Cisco's down, Salesforce is up, they have exceeded their revenue, they're going to be a $10 billion company, uh, revenue company by 2018, fastest to $10 billion in history. And it shows that Mark Benioff is literally a force we reckon with in terms of their cloud, but they have the mother of all lock-ins. And again, I commented on TechCrunch and said, 
hey, you know, data is the power. Database was the lock-in, we saw that with Oracle. Now data is the lock-in. We know Salesforce went after LinkedIn, they went after Twitter, and they actually actually stoked the government, which I think shouldn't even be involved. And we'll talk about FanDuel and those other things later, but you know, when the government gets involved, innovation gets killed, in my opinion. So to me, I think, I think Benioff, you know, poking at the government to look at these deals, kind of, mm, I'm not sure like that. But he's got the mother of all lock-ins in the data. And well, that, that to me is, uh, you know, and they get the cloud, and that points to how Amazon's being successful, why those guys are successful. Data's a lock-in, I mean. Well, data's a lock-in, there's a couple things he's got going on. And just regular subscription revenue is tough to beat. You get people on, they set it up on automatic payment, and they yeah. pay every month, they get their payment. The other thing that he was smart to do on the sales force as an application space is get close to the revenue. Right. If you're close to the revenue, yeah. there is revenue there for you. Well, revenue to funds back. business, exactly. business funds workflow. So you control the money, follow the money, as we always say. Um, this is this is the big thing. But the Amazon's the same way. You can get in, but you can't get out once you get in. <laughs> once you get uh, in. Hotel California. And hotel Seattle. <laughs> no, it's Hotel Seattle now because you got Microsoft and Amazon in Seattle. Yeah, uh, and, we'll and a new and a new and a new venture. Uh, Cube alumni the move in Seattle. Hep, Heptio. Heptio, yeah. Craig McClucky. Craig McClucky, we're going to talk about that open source is booming again. Open source is driving all this value. And again, this is why I think Cisco, a proprietary company, trying to be open source. Salesforce, not so much open source, although they, they have they use open source, it's that they have the killer business model. It's cloud, it's subscription, it's data, and it's the sales data, which is the revenue which fuels business. So now they can sequence into other areas and slowly take territory. Yes. <laughs> and it's, their expansion is unlimited unless they over overplay their hand, in my right. opinion. Right. So, well, it's, you know, when people talk about cloud, they talk about cloud infrastructure. They don't often talk enough about cloud applications, SaaS applications, because the SaaS applications led by Salesforce on the enterprise space continue to prove out the model that that is the best way to innovate, it's the best way to lock people in, it's the best way to deliver services and we see it over and over and over again. Um, it, I think Charles Phillips, you know, announced with Infor a couple of years ago, I think it was three years ago now, that they are flipping all their all their uh, industry-specific um, apps to cloud on Amazon because that's really the best way to deliver software. So we're getting some great commentary on just getting the last segment. The fake news thing is getting everyone all riled up. I love fake you know, news. Amir is uh, uh, one of my Facebook friends. I hope you'd fight st you'd fight this fake news nonsense instead of promoting it. First of all, I'm not promoting it. I'm actually slam dunking it, Amir. So FYI, you know, the fake news is uh, is what it is. You can't fight reality. Fake news was working and people actually click on it, so they're dumb. Um, and he goes, in, in a relative world, the fake, fake to one person is real to another and vice versa could lead to dangerous censorship. Good morning, by the way, is what he said. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Amir, for your commentary. No, but Jeff, he brings up a good point, not to go back to fake news, but he brings up a point, which is what is fake to someone it might be actually real. Sense, so he brings up the whole censorship. If you go down the slippery slope of starting to identify fake news, that could be a red herring to censorship. So interesting point. Thanks for bringing that up, Amir. Your thoughts well, and on how that? To, and how do you find, I mean, you have to do the research to figure it out. My, my favorite fake news story of all time is is gambling in international soccer, where they have these friendlies and they would have like, Portugal versus uh, United Arab Emirates, and they put a line on that and take bets. And guess what? The match never even happened and they're taking money on it <laughs> because people want to put money now. So did it happen? Did it so not they're, happen? They're I mean, fake data. I mean, so you just have to be smart. You just have to look at everything with a critical eye because you just don't know and there's plenty of fake news that's come out from established yeah. news organizations so just because it says wall yeah. street journal new york times that well, doesn't necessarily make it so either. well let me give you an so, example in the new york times the new york times put out an article that said hillary was going to win by two million votes they're not even close they were way over the number she was signing covers of newsweek before the the night no of the my election. point is I mean, new york on. times was reporting that she was going to win by two million votes that's not even the number. Uh, so is it fake news or or that or, is inaccurate news? Back inaccurate to the censor. Right. Well, no, but back to the, back to the censorship <laughs> okay. conversation. This is a legit conversation that needs to be had, and, I, and I'm glad glad for Amir for bringing that up. And just be responsible for your own information data collection, and don't say things unless you have a pretty good source. And if you and if you have a source, reference the source. Okay, so now let's get to the Russians since they are on Trump's side. They are they're in the news again. Um, <laughs> Fake news right there, fake news alert. In fact, I was at meeting with uh, someone in San Francisco and I wrote on my Facebook page, fake breaking news, alcohol sales are up after the election. Uh, got a lot of laughs. What but, are Chelsea Handler gonna do? <laughs> she, she's still crying. Um, 
The Russians blocked LinkedIn after they refused to hand over the data. So this is a legit story. Russians have blocked LinkedIn because they refused to hand, hand the data over to the country. Again, back to Amir's point in, in a kind of orthogonal way is, this is the censorship. This is the global landscape we live in. We're gonna have these silos of data, certainly outside North America and the US. You've got countries who are gonna be very parochial about their data and use that as a way to censor. So again, access to the data comes back down to the data, Jeff. Yeah, I think it's like, like you said, it's the Arab Spring. As soon as Facebook starts flying those those big planes that can beam down, uh, you know, internet access and stay up for years and years and years, you know, the ability the ability to control and block is not the solution. It's just like the whole security conversation that we talk about all the time. Putting up fences in the end is not going to yeah. continue to work. There are too many ways around it. So you have to figure out a better way to deal with it than trying just to block stuff off. It's not going to work. Well, the, the world's very chubby on us. As an analogy, I was telling a startup, I'm like, look at it, you want to build a boat and you're starting. Think about like building a boat. You got to be able to take the waves crashing on the deck right now because the world is turning. Look at the LinkedIn. You you got to go out there. You're competing against, with scale vendors. You're competing with customers who want real time. You got software change in the world. GE was in town and they were bringing the whole industrial internet thing with digital. That company's completely changing over right, from right. turbines to software. Right. So this is the new world, Jeff. I mean, this is the this is the world we're living. In. You mentioned open source, the, you know, big funding for the guys who founded Kubernetes. No one's ever heard of Kubernetes, but now it's the hottest thing. Eight and a half million dollar <laughs> launching a round. That's a pretty good round <laughs> for Craig and the team. Yeah, I know. Well, one Keep of them, on one the of move. them was the inventor of Kubernetes. So you know, <laughs> they see a, a Cloudera in there. Cloudera, which pioneered uh, MapReduce and became kind of the poster child for big data. They hope that's the same for Kubernetes. Yeah, you know, the thing that comes up, John, and it came up at the GE conversation is there. There's, there really seems to be two kinds of views of the future. One is the dark uh, total recall uh, version where the robots take over the world. And the other one is really, it is more of, of the, the utopia where you know the machines are taking over the heavy lifting, undifferentiated heavy lifting, and, and things are good. The, I'm sure the truth is somewhere in the middle, but we are moving and we're moving faster. Beth Comstock in her keynote at the G thing said, we even walk faster through the cities. What's, than the, rele what, what's, the, rele what's the relevance to that? I mean, that point, that's a good point, but what's the relevance? Where do you want to apply yourself? Where do you think the future is? What are you trying to change in your future. It's interesting that the girls in tech thing we went to the other day, of the 10 startups, three of them were doctors. Okay, doctors and, and, and the medical profession gets dinged all the time about yeah. being slow and not being progressive. And here, one of the doctors that I talked to said, you know, I grew up with a mobile phone and now I want every single, um, the latest research available to me in my palm, on my phone, so when I'm doing a diagnosis, with a patient, I've got the best information possible. And oh, by the way, that frees up my time now to spend more quality human to human time with my patient. There, there's two very different views. You can choose to kind of support the one that you want and put your effort behind the, the world that you want to see. I was just getting a text. I was trying to get Virginia Heffernan and she wrote a post, which I posted on Facebook and it was uh, about, you know, I love Hillary Clinton. And she, she has a history, she's biased towards Hillary Clinton, but she's a great writer. But it was kind of like a, a clever article because she was saying, why can't we just say we love her? and just say, you know, we think she's awesome. And it was basically a fan of Hillary and it was a really well-written article, but it brings up the point of, you know, you can't really say what you stand for anymore. It's like, you're afraid, people are bashing people left and right. You say, hey, I'm a conservative or I'm a Christian or I'm a, I'm a liberal, I'm, you know, I'm a, you can't do that anymore without getting hate. That is a huge issue, and I think she wrote this clever article, um, and, and, and she was kind of right on the money. Hey, why can't we just say we love Hillary Clinton? Let's, and then, Slam her after if you're going to slam her. But at least it's okay to say your position. And I think Trump is the same way. No one, I know, I don't know one person, except for some people in my family who no longer I disown them. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> um, who said, I am for Trump. I am for Trump. Who, how many people do you know? I don't know of anybody. I do know. I do know people that voted for Trump. The, the, the question, again, for me on the Trump thing, and I think why there's such a division of, of feelings is there's a lot of stuff that Trump said that was very hateful. Um, and there's a lot of positions that he took that are a little dodgy uh, and, and, and beyond. That's a different conversation than I think people voted against the status quo. They voted against the Republicans because Trump wasn't supported by the Republicans. They voted against the Democrats. They voted against the status quo media. I think that's what powered that election. And that's why I think 
that election statement is going to be very different than how things move forward and see if he can execute or not. And right, I think we, that's why. Do we want to try to dial in some some folks? Who are you going to call? I'm going to try to call. Ghostbusters. I'm going to try to call Matt Oko because he's a data guy. We talk about data lock in. I talked to him on LinkedIn. Unless he's going to pick up. Let's see. If All he right. Picks well, up. John's dialing. Be sure to go to the crowd chat. It's crowdchat.net slash Silicon Valley. Um, you can, of course, always follow uh, follow us on Twitter. We've got a little bit of a conversation going on there. And um, and then siliconangle.tv has the video versions of the Friday show. <laughs> Will he pick up? Sound, cloud, search for the Matt. cube. Smack an answer. He's going to win tickets gonna... to the 49ers Patriots games. Oh, voicemail. <laughs> Ooh, you want to hide that number. Hide, put your finger over the uh, blah, 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 blah. We don't want you to hear the number. <laughs> hey, Matt, John Fur, you're live on the Silicon Valley Friday show with Jeff Frick. Try to get a hold of you, uh, talk about data, data science. But, uh, dude, what are you doing, deals right now? You're not going to pick up the phone? Let's do this. Jeff, any questions for Matt? Maybe you can comment on Twitter. No. No? <laughs> <laughs> Matt, you missed an opportunity. Come on, we want to talk about data and your investments. Next time, baby, pick up. Let's try to get somebody else. Yeah. Let's do, uh, let's get in and try to do another one. Let's see if we can get Who to... are you going to call? Do you, we need some like Jeopardy music? Do, 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 do. Are we in Sirius yet? Sirius Radio 702. All right, here we go. Who's it going to be? It's like a surprise. Yeah. And Christmas isn't even yeah. here yet. We want, we want people who can actually spice things up. I like Matt because he's very colorful and smart. Liners. Okay, go to crowdchat.net slash silicon angle. We okay. started to build our 27. I'm not going to say who this schedule. is so that. Oh, see, the words out. <laughs> the words out. They're, they're all hiding up. from you, John. Well, look, at, they're all terrible VCs to begin with. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even go, I wouldn't even go to them, you know. Um, if they call, if they pick uh, up, they're great. If they don't, Nice you statement know. on Jerry Chen who answers his phone. <laughs> Jerry Chen and Paul Martino are the best VCs in the business. You know, you go to those guys, Bullpen Capital they answer the and phone. Greylock. Um, well, a lot of these VCs are followers too. I mean, there's leaders and there's followers. I mean, to me, the, if you look at the VC culture, Jeff, right now, it's like right now the VCs are trying to pick the winners and the world's changing so fast. They don't even know what the winners are. And, and I'm hearing so many stories in Silicon Valley where they're raising so much money that they are actually passing on deals. And I'll give you an example. There's one VC that I know that actually passed on a deal that was doing $40 million in revenue. The entrepreneur only needed like $3 million. They were kicking ass and passed on the deal because they were too afraid to do the deal. And they said, come back and we'll pay double the valuation because they just want to de-risk it. So what that means is they're moving away from the real investment risk side of it and mostly on the growth side. So what that means is that these companies that are actually winning go to the partnerships and they don't understand the business. It's like, ah, 40 million and growing. I mean, you don't need enough money. You need 20 million. Well, the, they the, got to put more money to work. The, the, that's the, that's the reality is they got to put a lot of money to work. And it's a transaction based business and you divide a billion by an average transaction amount. And, and it takes just as much work for a VC to do a million dollar deal as a $10 million deal as a $50 million deal. And that's, you know, part of the problem the the bad problem of having, a billion dollar fund to work. Well, the VC market is being disrupted. The press is being disrupted. And, you know, if we start seeing fake VC out there, then we're going to know, <laughs> we're going to know that, you know, that the world's in trouble and I'm certainly going to be disrupted. A lot of seed funding going on, a lot of new opportunities. We'll be back in our next segment. We're going to do the thinking out loud. We're going to go into pre Thanksgiving mode, what we're thankful for and look at some of the key things that we see in our radar for the next half of the year. Obviously Amazon reinvents coming up. Uh, HPE in London are going to be a show to see how HP's transforming. Obviously, Meg Whitman's kind of in the back end of her five-year uh, commitment to turn that around. Um, they're shedding businesses. They're 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 doing corporate development. And uh, again, they had a 30% layoff. So we're going to we're going to dig into that. But we're going to also dig into Amazon, the impact of that, and also what we're thankful for. It's Thanksgiving next week. I'm John Furrier, listening to the Silicon Valley Friday Show. We'll be right back. I remember when I had such a fantastic batting practice, I walked by a couple of sports writers in that era. Hall of Famer, Reggie Jackson. It was like, you were rocking it out I, there. I, I, I kind of hope I didn't leave it out here. Reggie <laughs> <laughs> Jackson. When the game started, right, right. I got back in that moment. Right. I got back in what was live, what was now. Right. 
Goodbye. I went and did a uh, something with ESPN earlier this year with Stephen Curry. They said, Reggie, we want you to come up and watch his practice, his pregame. You know, it was very similar to your batting practice where people come out and watch, etc. And I watched the dribbling exhibition. I watched the going between the legs and the behind the back and the fancy passing, etc. And I watched the shots. And the guy asked me what I thought of the show. And I said, well, it, it's a cool show, but I'm going to see all that tonight. He does all that. He put I it said, into the game. Yeah, I said, so it, <laughs> it's, a, it's not a show, but that's his game. Mr. October. I think our world now, with the instant gratification of, of sending out a message or tweeting to someone or some, whatever, certainly in the moment, uh, is about what our youth is and, and who we are today as, as a country, as a, as a universe. Congratulations, Reggie Jackson. You are CUBE alumni. Hi, I'm Stu Miniman. I've been an analyst with Wikibon and a co-host of the Cube since 2010. It's been an exciting journey working with theCUBE. Uh, we get to go out to so many shows, help extract the signal from the noise, uh, interact with such a wide variety of, uh, of, of clientele, both practitioners, thought leaders, some big name uh, industry people, and we've helped some people uh, raise their profiles in there. Uh, especially love working with those practitioners. Uh, we've seen them move their careers forward and move their businesses forward as they take advantage of uh, technologies and practices uh, that they've learned. Talking with us, working with our research people and working with their peers. This is Stu Miniman. Thanks for watching The Cube. You're listening to the Silicon Valley Friday Show with John Furrier. Okay, we're back. You're listening to the Silicon Valley Friday Show. I'm John Furrier. Joining me today is Jeff Frick. This is kind of our, our Thinking Out Loud segment, kind of thoughts of, thoughts of the week. Um, a couple things jumped out while we were on that break we didn't mention on the news was that Intel just had a big announcement yesterday about a their AI, their Nirvana uh, intelligence and the AI, artificial intelligence, augmented intelligence, which IBM calls it. But you're really seeing Intel kind of moving into the chip game, and I think it's under a lot of pressure from NVIDIA. We had NVIDIA covered, we covered those guys at Big Data NYC, our event that goes on during Big Data Week. Uh, and there's also another companion event that goes on Strata as well. But during Big Data NYC, we talked to NVIDIA. NVIDIA owns the graphics. And you talk to any kid out there, they recognize anyone under the age of 25 looks at NVIDIA and Intel and says, I love NVIDIA. Right. I don't right. know anyone under the age of 25 that says, I love Intel. Right. Because what happens in a lot of these AI situations and the VR situations, right, is basically through a, a collection of data through the sensors, they're basically almost creating a video game of the local reality inside of the computer. And that's what's powering these autonomous vehicles and self-driving cars. And so NVIDIA is really, really well positioned to take advantage of that because then that is then the algorithm that the computers work from to create the reality uh, from which they use to control and, the car. And if you've seen the video of what the world looks like from the eye of a Google car, it looks like a video game. Yeah, the relevance of this is that the, the, there's a battle going on in the world right now, and that is Intel owned the monopoly on the PC business. Okay, now the world's changing. You got cars you mentioned, you got virtual reality, a new set of developers, and Intel needs to have a new identity. They need a new Polaroid picture of themselves. They need an Instagram picture of themselves. That's a fresh Intel, the new Intel inside. Like I said, NVIDIA is dominating because they're sexy, they're cool, they're running the graphics. Kids who play video games, anyone who knows anything with rich media loves NVIDIA because right, right. they're the best at the graphics chips and then now have moved those chips into machine learning. So they've been growing very, very fast. We're very big fans of NVIDIA. Now Intel needs to kind of get back, use their market power and get back in the game. Right, and right. it's going to be uh, th those two guys. But don't forget IBM, Jeff, a little, little nuance here, which we reported on siliconangle.com. I don't think anyone else reported this piece of it. But IBM has a piece of the game here with their power systems, so their power AI initiative with their with their with their chips. So don't count IBM out. But IBM is well, certainly a player in this. It's funny as well. the Open Power Summit is this little tiny um, mini conference inside of NVIDIA GPU uh, tech conference, and we've covered it for the last couple of years. So you know, back in the day, uh, Intel made a big play, got a lot of people out of the microprocessor business. Sun Silicon Graphics back in the time, uh, HP had their own processors, but now you're seeing the specialty processors come back. Open Power is one of them, so yeah. uh, it's definitely a competitive world. What are you hearing out there in the streets right now? I mean, right now, the um, 
the Thanksgiving is upon us. I see people working their butt off this week to get to clear the decks for next week so they can just relax. Um, certainly, the VCs aren't even picking up, uh, which means they're you know either they're off already or or, uh, or 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 they're not. What do you think? Yeah, I, I don't know. Everyone seems to be working hard, hard, hard. I don't know how you're clearing your decks. My my decks are stacking up. I'll be working uh, next Stack week. overflow. Yeah, we're working like crazy. Yeah. I mean, the the, the the kind of back to the political thing. The, the thing that I keep seeing is is you know in the in the conversation of jobs and and how they're going to be new jobs and are we going to bring the jobs back you know let's talk about the re, the reality the next great wave of job destruction is coming in in truck drivers and i'm keyed off to this there's just a tweet that went by and this has been i think cb insights put this out the most the most jobs in each state in terms of the number of people employed in this position is truck driver that is going to be the thing is autonomous vehicles is not about it yourself driving car to get you here john in the morning it's about trucks and commercial fleets and that's coming and that was that was not talked about in the election and that's going to be another huge well, wave of people no, that have good all, blue collar jobs that now need to they don't uh, well first of all get, it wasn't talked about in the election because no one really knows what the heck's going on and here's the deal if trump trump was doing this whole thing about we're gonna bring manufacturing jobs back to michigan all these states they had this the swing states he had the you know, it's schmooze, basically. There's no freaking way those jobs are coming back as they were at all. Those jobs are gone. They're gone. They're gone. They're not coming back. What we, What is coming back is a new kind of job. That's my rant on the internet access. If you bring back the tax, the all that money that's being held overseas, the top 30 U.S. companies are holding a uh, trillion dollars overseas. The top four of them, of the top four, three of them are tech companies, Apple, uh, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, they're all got cash overseas because they're going to get taxed. So, okay, bring it back, give them a tax holiday, and then say you get tax-free if you invest in Michigan. But here's the thing. Those manufacturing jobs are not coming back. There's no jobs. The world's flattening out. So they're going to be internet jobs, going to be programming jobs, going to be software jobs. Those people need to be retrained. No one even talked about that at all. That was a, a big miss in the election. And again, no internet access, no access to jobs, in my opinion. Well, and well, even that's, that's and even the manufacturing jobs that moved offshore are going to go away. Foxconn is announcing layoffs, right? They're the big off, uh, off, offshore manufacturing company, and the robots are moving into their factories too. Oh, by the way, so I think you're right. The, it, it's funny. You, we were just in Vienna at at uh, at the Newtonic show, and the guy said we had a hundred megs up and down. Right? We're pretty sensitive to what our internet is, and the world is just different, John. At a hundred megs up and down it opens up things that you would never even think about and i think you're right if we had 100 megs to the home whether that's yeah. via google fiber or people could or write wireless. for us they could do podcasts they but could do you know, machine learning they can write software they can start a business put a website the out information all is kinds amazing. of great opportunities and this is going to meet to me clinton tried to do this with the farm bill with bringing broadband to everybody it didn't work because it got politicized you just got to go out and just saying the government's got to take a, a little bit of a socialist position on my part but i think it's the right thing to do we have free roads and free inter interstate highways why not have free internet access yeah. if you want faster internet access Take the toll road. That could be Comcast or whatever. So to me, I think you could offer some nice mix hybrid on that. Um, but again, thinking out loud, that's my take. Other thoughts to me is um, this, as we go into Thanksgiving, is what we're thankful for. And I got to tell you, I'm thankful that we have SiliconANGLE Media, the Cube, and because what we do and what I love doing with the Cube, and you do, you you run that, and you do the same, is talking to fresh people, new people, surfacing, highlighting awesome people that aren't going to get on CNBC, CNN, or Bloomberg or other outlets. Love interviewing great people. I love experts as content. I love fostering more data and more conversations. I love the fact that we have great sponsors like Red Hat at KubeCon and, and some great supporters that, who, who understand the community. Uh, that's certainly thankful, thankful to the team, but also thankful the fact that, you know, we finally got through the election. <laughs> you know, that was a huge, now we can get back to business. And again, Amazon reinvent right on the corner and I'm already seeing Christmas lights around town. You, what, are you, what are you thankful for? I don't know, I'm thankful for a lot of things, Sean. I, I am thankful we're in a really f uh, unique and, and fun position. It's, it's absolutely fun to sit down with people like at the GE show uh, earlier this week who are so passionate, even in a 130-year-old startup, to reinvent that company and, and bring new innovation. I'm excited to be in Silicon Valley. I've been here since 1985 that continues to reinvent itself over and over. And again, just last night or two nights ago, we were in the city talking to 10 
women entrepreneurs, some young, some not not as young, uh, and this this kind of con- total regeneration over and over and over uh, that that Silicon Valley continues to drive, which is phenomenal. You talked about Salesforce, their tower now, sixty stories is really towering over the skyline in San Francisco. So even those companies that have been for around for a while continue to reinvent themselves, and and it's an exciting time. It's a crazy time. It's yeah. a scary time, but but it's a terrific time, and it's our time. Yeah. I'm not thankful for Matt Oko, who didn't pick up the phone. So Matt, his Twitter handle is Matt O C K O. Tweet him, oh, calling him out tweet on him, and tell him that he's a bum for not coming. Come I'm picking on, up Matt. the phone. No, seriously, Matt's a great guy. I wanted to have him on because he's colorful and uh, he's smart. So uh, again, that's what we want to try to do here. And uh, you know, thanks to Paul Martino and Jerry Chen, who did come on and uh, check those guys out. Greylock and Bullpen Capital, and then we'll call someone up next week. Uh, it'll be the Friday holiday, which we'll try to do a lightweight show, probably do a little turkey leg in the studio um, and have some fun. You listen invite to this, you in the Silicon Valley Friday show. Uh, have a great Thanksgiving and uh, see you next time. Thanks for listening. <laughs>